Hello, and welcome to Beyond COVID, a podcast and video series that explores how our legal system is changing in an almost post-pandemic world. I am David Levy, director of the Bolch Judicial Institute and president of the American Law Institute. We have recently experienced one of the most extraordinary presidential elections in our history. In the midst of a pandemic, more Americans voted than at any time in our history. That was the good news. Yet the election quickly became controversial. President Trump refused to accept the outcome and claimed that the election had been stolen from him. There were more than 60 lawsuits filed on his behalf across the country, challenging the election results. In addition to these efforts, President Trump began a series of unprecedented attempts to pressure state election officials and others, including the vice president, in an effort to overturn the outcome. These efforts culminated in the attempt to disrupt Congress's certification process at the United States Capitol on January 6. Today, we will hear about the work of three former solicitors general who anticipated and spent months preparing as best they could for what they uh, anticipated would be President Trump's attack on the election outcome. Joining us today are Walter Dellinger, who served as acting solicitor general during the Clinton administration and is a professor of law emeritus at Duke Law School, my colleague, Walter. Seth Waxman, who served as solicitor general during the Clinton administration and is a partner at William Hale and a member of the Council of the American Law Institute, Seth. And Don Verrilli, who served as solicitor general during the Obama administration and is a partner with Munger Tolls and Olson and a wonderful person, Don. What an honor to have the three of you with us here today. So we're here with three former solicitors general who've had amazing careers in the law and continue to have amazing careers. And they played such an important role in the aftermath to the, uh, to the last election, um, which was uh, an, unusual, <laughs> an unusual experience, let us say. Uh, and Seth Waxman, you, were, you put together this team. I think you're called SG3. And why don't we just get out right now at the beginning that you guys have hoodies let's let's see them <laughs> you bet. As, there there they are yeah. sg3 you are a legal <laughs> strike force and i know seth uh, you are the i think the you, you are the creator of this amazing <laughs> elite uh you know sealed legal seal team uh and tell us about that how, how did how did that happen well sure i mean i i just want to say um this experience, uh, which began at least for me in late March or early April last year, you know, has all the characteristics of both a, a never ending nightmare and a never ending dream come true. Um, as it happens, I guess never ending isn't right. They they both ended, but the memories will always be there. And, and for me at least when it started was, um, in, I can't remember whether it was in March or early April, but I um, often have the habit of waking up at three o'clock in the morning when there's something really on my mind, usually work related. And the way that I typically deal with it is to go down to my study um, and spend an hour working on whatever it is that is on my mind. And after an hour, I feel like, yes, I have a you know, I'm ahead of the day already and it's not even morning. I go back to sleep like a baby. Um, but what I was waking up and worrying about was whether we were gonna actually have an election and whether uh, the popular results of the election will be allowed, would be allowed to determine who the next president and vice president and members of the Congress would be. Um, you know, Donald Trump had already started talking about how the only way he could possibly lose the ex election is that there's massive fraud and he couldn't guarantee that he would accept the results of the election and all these sort of ominous things that really you would 
I think very few people in our history had, had ever thought they would ever hear from a president of the United States. And I started waking up in the middle of the night thinking, oh my God, what if he like cancels the election? Or what if he federalizes the National Guard to you know, ostensibly protect, but in reality intimidate? voters and what if the he just declares that you know mail in ballots are invalid or so tampered by fraud that they can't be counted or that you know state legislatures rather than the people get to decide who the presidential and vice presidential electors are and so true to form i started getting up and spending an hour adding to this growing list of these various scenarios that, uh, you know, I kept thinking, well, when I actually am up in the morning and awake, I'll look at these things and realize this is just, you know, midnight terrors and not something that is real, but um, it kept going and the list got to almost four pages of these scenarios. And um, I called, uh, uh, a good friend named Fred Wertheimer, who runs a uh, a nonprofit with which I've worked for many years on election protection and campaign finance stuff. And he told me that he was worried about the same things too. And that why didn't I like do a, you know, organize a project for his group, Democracy 21. Um, and I said, that's great. He, he thought that you know, there actually might be funds available to fund something like this in the name of good government, not, you know, not really on behalf of one candidate or another. And um, so I started, you know, recruiting people from my law firm to work on these projects. And it didn't take very long to realize that although you know, Wilmer Hale is a very big law firm. <laughs> it wasn't big enough to remotely come up with, with all of the, to deal with all of these scenarios. And so um, I thought, you know, we need to make this a project and who, you know, a bigger project. And, you know, honestly, I reached out to Walter and Don and only Walter and Don figuring that this, you know, if, if we could all do this together, along with lawyers at our firms and at other firms, this would be a dream come true. I mean, you know, we more or less travel in the same professional circles, but honestly, it's, it's, the, it's the great exception rather than the rule that I get a chance to actually work with Don or Walter. And the idea of not only seeing them and talking with them about these difficult problems all the time, but actually working together collaboratively was just, you know, like a dream come true. And so I reached out to, to my two friends and they both said, yes, we're game. Um, and uh, Fred was more than delighted. Um, and we started thinking about how we would divide things up. Um, it seemed like the one thing that we needed to know was whether in fact this entire effort was already being done by somebody else. And since the most logical plaintiff for in any litigation challenging any of these scenarios would be Vice President Biden because nobody was really thinking that he was either inclined or able to do any of these things that we were worried about. Um, I reached out to uh, the campaign, to Chris Dodd and Bob Bauer, to basically say, we're thinking about doing this, what do you think? And they were enthusiastic. You know, Bob was like, we haven't started anything like this, but this would be absolutely fabulous. Um, the one thing we probably should do is stay in touch with you and coordinate so we won't have to reinvent the wheel and replicate what you and Walter and Don are doing. Um, that got me very nervous because although I think there would in fact be nothing legally wrong with us maintaining an independent nonpartisan effort that 
that kept in touch with other relevant groups, including the presidential campaign, there are, you know, rules involving proscribing coordination, you know, with political campaigns and the proscription against, you know, undeclared excessive campaign contributions. And rather than getting into a debate or putting our law firms or the Biden campaign or Democracy 21 into any sort of news story about how you know, we're making um, excessive campaign contributions or coordinating in violation of the laws, the three of us decided that we would just forget our dreams of you know, actually getting paid for this work and sign up as individual volunteer lawyers for the campaign. Um, and that's, and we presented it to them and that's how we, we got started. So that's very exciting. So you, ha you had your dream team uh, put together and now you had your, your structure. You're gonna be, uh, uh, instead of being free agents, you were gonna, you, you joined the Biden campaign as volunteers. And now you have to decide, um, how to organize yourself. So uh, how did you organize yourself? And then I'd like to ask each one of you about your own particular area. Uh, I think it might've been the, the, the somber voice of reason and rationality of Brother Virilli, who basically said, okay, we got a really long, scary list here. And we're gonna try to find volunteer lawyers to do all these things, but we have to figure out some way to split it up and you know Don you'll correct me if if uh, if I misremember this but I think Don had said that he and colleagues had done some work on uh, you know federal emergency powers and perhaps if we looked at all the scenarios that I had drafted up which were I mean there was a discrete list of scenarios, leading up to the election, a discrete list of things that could happen on election day, a list of things that would happen between election day and the meeting of the electors in December, and then a list of things that could happen after the meeting of the electors up to and including not only January 6th, but inauguration day. And I think what Don suggested was, look, I, we've been looking at some of these federal things. Why don't I try to organize teams and look at all the things that either President Trump or the national government could do in order to interfere with an election, a fair, the fair conduct of an election or a fair accounting of the popular results of the election. And my recollection, which you know is, is often faulty is Walter said, look, I've been thinking about you know, the meeting of the electors and the joint session of Congress ever since Al Gore's campaign. And it's really interesting. And there are some very complicated, unresolved questions. Why don't I take, why don't, why don't I take everything that happens, you know, from the time of the electors until the time that the new president is safely inaugurated? And that seemed fine. And so I, uh, was responsible for leading teams uh, that were looking at things that could happen either by virtue of an affirmative act of a state legislature or a state governor, or as a result of litigation brought by the Trump campaign, Trump supporters, uh, you know, or private citizens seeking to require state governments to do all sorts of things that I thought would constitute unlawful and unconstitutional interference with a full and fair vote, leading up to uh, the, the meeting of the electors. So Don and I sort of split it up for everything from day one all the way up until I guess it was December 12th and Walter took from December 12th on. Um, I'm a, can I interject that I'm, I'm, I'm Southern and something of a slacker. So I thought if I take January the 6th, I mean, what could go, he'll never get there. You know? And so I can, I can, I can easily be responsible for that. <laughs> that is funny. Uh, well, why don't we, why don't we do this? Why don't we go to Don 
uh, since you were you sort of had the the before the election, and then we can go uh, we can go back to you, Seth, because you had you had sort of a, some specialty topics within that, that same time period, and then Walter, we'll go to you for that uneventful period after the election, um, and uh, and then uh, and then we can all the three of us, uh, all, all three of you can kind of chat about some of these legal issues that may still be outstanding. So, Don. Sure. So, you know, uh, my recollection is just like Seth's about how this unfolded and, you know, all credit to him for uh, taking the initiative here and getting it up and going. And I share Seth's feeling about it all, too, that, you know, it was at the same time one of the most exhilarating and rewarding experiences I've had as a lawyer and one of the most upsetting, you know, spending month after month staring into the abyss and coming to appreciate just how fragile our whole constitutional system is and how much of it actually depends on um, people acting uh, with good faith and not trying to push, uh, the, push on the soft spots uh, in our system uh, to, the, to the point where they puncture them. And so in focus, you know, my focus was on the, you know, what ways could federal power be deployed uh, by the executive branch to disrupt the electoral process. And it was influenced, I would say, a great deal by things that were happening in the country in June of last year. Uh, the, you know, two in particular, the deployment of federal troops in Washington, D.C. in response to the Black Lives Matter protests. And I think it seared in all of our consciousness back then, uh, you know, those helicopters flying over the streets of Washington, D.C. and the uh, armed uh, federal forces clearing out Lafayette Square, you know, realizing, well, yeah, well, you know, it's not out of the question that something like this could happen around Election Day. And then the other thing, of course, was the deployment of DHS forces to Portland, Oregon, to protect uh, federal buildings and property there under various authorities that they have. So, you know, one thing we focused on was, well, what kinds of authorities does the pre can the president invoke to deploy troops uh, or other federal forces in a manner that might disrupt the election? And what can we do about it? Um, then we looked at a, a, the many various ways that the Department of Justice uh, might uh, exercise its powers um, in a way that um, could uh, deter uh, voting by mail, cast suspicion on the legitimacy of voting by mail, or even further to you know, disrupt the electoral process. Um, and you know, so we canvassed the various voting rights statutes that could uh, have been perverted to, uh, to, in our minds at least, uh, the nefarious purpose actually of uh, undermining uh, the electoral process. And did very, uh, very substantial white papers on a whole range as I, I, you know, we had probably just my little group alone probably had 15 or 20 white papers. And then we prepared pleadings, you know, not every one of these situations was uh, equally amenable to a judicial response, but a lot of them were. Um, and so we analyzed, well, who can, you know, who can be a proper plaintiff here, who can get standing to challenge the president's invocation of the Insurrection Act. and what statutory and constitutional limits would there be on that? And how do we fashion that into a uh, action for preliminary injunction? And we just went all the way through every possible scenario that we could contemplate at the federal level and figured out, um, uh, figured out what our best response would be and had it ready. And I'd, I would say, I don't know, it was probably mid by mid-September to late September, we basically, not just for my group, but for all of them, and especially Seth's group, which was the biggest sprawling mass of the whole thing. We really had comprehensive pleadings ready on just about everything by the latter part of September. Um, and, uh, you know, really were ready to go. And we should, once, once we work through Walter's stuff, we should probably talk about the ways in which these pieces fit together. Because that was something that, you know, I, I remember very vividly. So as we were, you know, we would be on email or on the phone all the time, the three of us, you know, in addition to our conversations with the campaign. And I remember kind of the middle of August, it's starting to distill that, well, actually, the problem here is not necessarily one discrete exercise of uh, power by the federal government, one discrete action by the state. 
but the kind of negative synergy that could come about if all of these things came together in the wrong way. If, you know, in addition to President Trump's constant rhetoric about uh, fraud through mail-in balloting and, you know, what if DOJ added fuel to that fire by making allegations of fraud around the election? Uh, and then what if that in turn influenced state legislatures to step in and say, you know, we're going to rely on the predicate that the Department of Justice has set to in, uh, invoke our uh, residual constitutional authority uh, to dictate who the electors are going to be awarded to. And then, then in turn, what would happen when all of that got dropped into Congress's lap uh, later in the process? And so it, it was the kind of coming together of all those things. And, you know, sadly, we really, you know, <laughs> We got it right. I mean, it didn't. It didn't actually come to pass, but the things we determined we should be most afraid of actually were a realistic prospect uh, by by November, December of last year. Um, so you know, I guess it was it was not imprudent to be worried about them the way we were. I, you didn't mention the pandemic. Is did, was that within Seth's jurisdiction or was that within yours? I think both. It kind of depended, you know, that to the extent to we, we thought about to what extent could the president declare a national emergency, you know, with all the work under the national emergency, various national emergency statutes, to what extent could he declare a national emergency and shut down voting? We thought that was going to be a hard, a heavy lift for them because, um, you know, the Constitution delegates to the states the power to prescribe the, the manner of conducting the elections and the states have done so. And, uh, you know, wasn't in, nothing was inconceivable. We thought that was sort of our basic rule going forward that we should assume nothing was inconceivable here. Um, and, uh, and, and we did definitely look at that, but it, it didn't loom as large as you, might, as you might think in terms of our, at least of my fear index. It wasn't as high as other things of my fear index. Yeah, that's um, interesting because there have been some talk coming out of, I, I think the White House, I'm not, I'm not certain about postponing the election. Yeah, right. And, um, and you were ready for that. Yeah. Okay, let's let's go to Seth. Uh, you were primarily worried about state legislators, I think, is what you. So said I, I was. Um, what I, the teams that I organized, you know, of which I, I can't even. There were about twenty of them, twenty separate teams of volunteer lawyers, were looking at was were things that states or state authorities might do to postpone the election, prevent the election, circumscribe the election, uh, discount certain categories of votes that had been cast or would be cast, and then uh, you know, essentially interfere by changing the rules of the choice of electors uh, after the election and before the meeting of the electors. And we focused initially on, I think it was 18, states in which it looked like, well, I should also say that it, it, it also included, I mean, it was basically everything other than what the federal government might do on its own. So it also included state and, and, and even local authorities. And we worried a lot about, um, you know, what might happen at polling places in inner city and minority districts would, you know, would there be vigilantism as there were lots of threats of? And if so, was there a litigation response to it? And if there wasn't, what should we be doing in terms of coordination with state and local law enforcement? What if state and local law enforcement were deployed in a way that was ostensibly to protect voting, but in the real world had the effect of depressing uh, people's willingness to go vote? And, um, so we identified, uh, I, I sort of divided all of that up into things that we were worried that state authorities on their own might do. And we had a series of teams from five different, they weren't really law firms because these were all individual volunteer lawyers, but headed by partners at five different law firms, including mine. And then we identified seven different categories of things that bad things that might happen provoked by litigation against state and local officials. You know, running from, uh, you know, litigation to uh, 
postpone the election day because of the pretext of the pandemic or litigation to revise existing rules with respect to mail-in balloting or mail-in ballot dates and received by dates to even, I mean, we had a team that was addressing potential challenges in certain states to the legitimacy of Kamala Harris's candidacy because there had been some conservative I guess you would say scholars that had been opining that although Kamala Harris was born in the United States, that she was not a quote, natural born US citizen because her parents were in California on student visas at the time that she was, uh, at the time that she was born. And so we, we had with respect to um, all of these 20 or so teams, uh, not only white papers addressing all these possible scenarios, including many that, that actually came to pass in litigation between election day and, and almost inauguration day uh, in the form of something like 60 different lawsuits. Um, we had not only white papers on these issues, but we had template pleadings drafted for you know, each of you know, up to 15 states. Would we be in state court? Would we be in federal court? Did we wanna be in state court? Did we wanna be in federal court? If we were in federal court, what were the Pennhurst problems in raising state law issues? I mean, it was, a, it was an, an incredible body of what we hoped would be completely unnecessary work product. But I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of model pleadings dealing with different scenarios. So that's, you know, that's what the teams that I was, um, you know, ostensibly supervising were doing. And, you know, in addition to Don was talking about the fact that, you know, Don and Walter and I were in touch all the time about things um, and issues, overlapping issues and how we were each doing and gnarly questions that we were confronting. But I, you know, I also had, you know, very regular meetings with the various teams that were working in the various states and on the various different scenarios and helping them, you know, coordinate with each other so that everybody could make the most use of everybody else's thinking and work product. So, I mean, it was just, I mean, in terms of the level of effort, it was, you know, it was like the proverbial land war in Asia. Uh, let's uh, just stay with this for, for, for a minute here. Um, there, were, there were many court cases uh, after the election. Um, I think you said 60 or so, and I think there were at least that many. And um, I'm interested in two things. I mean, one, did, did your teams go in on behalf of the administration, uh, the new president? And, uh, and second, how would you evaluate how the courts, state and federal, uh, did their job during that uh, very hectic period? So we should start, we should give a shout out to Mark yeah. Elias and his uh, team of litigators who were, were the primary litigation counsel for the campaign in the DNC. They were the ones really on the ground uh, litigating. Because most of the issues that we actually fought about in, in court were ones that, um, you know, you, you could have, you know, it's that, arri that arise or at least can arise in, in, in a normal set of circumstances. Um, but we played a role sort of trying to think strategically with the campaign about what to push and what not to push and, and how, how to think all those things through. And then we would surface occasionally the, uh, we were involved publicly in the Pennsylvania case that went to the Supreme Court. Um, Great. Uh, but in, in general, we were doing more of a strategic role with Mark and his folks were, were on the ground, although, you know, very closely coordinating, especially Seth right. and his teams, I think, were drafting and editing the pleadings. Yeah, uh, we that were went in. in that in that post election period, I, I would say that I should say that as of election day, uh, our firm agreed to be retained by the Biden campaign and the DNC to actually undertake representation on a theory that you know, 
that Joe Biden was no longer a candidate. He was now the elected president-elect. Um, and I think probably out of the 65 or so cases, we actually you know, entered appearances and participated as counsel or co-counsel with, with uh, the Perkins Coie team and state counsel in about, I don't know, a good 40 of the cases, maybe more. Um, but it, it's, you know, our, our mandate from the campaign was similar to what, you know, the three of us had devised as, you know, what came to be known as the SG3 project. So, you know, nobody can, can come, nobody can come close to equaling the knowledge base and prowess of the, the Perkins Cooey team in terms of the kinds of things, the kinds of legal issues and challenges that come up in normal elections. And they certainly, as Don said, came up here. What we were asked to do was to become involved um, in anything that was unusual, <laughs> that wouldn't have been conceived of before, like this notion that you could simply throw out all mail-in ballots, or you could override a determination of the, the state election official about how many days after election day could a ballot postmark by election day be counted? Or was it, did state legislatures have the authority after the election to actually decide that no, they were going to pick which set of electors were the electors? Those kinds of challenges, which were, uh, more unique were the what was the stuff that we were you know actually involved in yeah and this was a good example that maybe illustrate the way in which we work together um you know with respect to this question of are you going to count mail-in ballots that arrive after election day and do state courts have any authority to allow that an issue immediately arose about what our position ought to be with respect to what states should do with those ballots. And we made the judgment very quickly as our SG3 team that we ought to press uh, the state officials in every state to segregate those ballots out. Um, and the reason we did that was because of the overarching concern we had about the intervention of a state legislature. We didn't want to create any possibility that there could be an argument on the part of a state legislature that the entire pool of mail-in ballots was tainted and therefore couldn't be considered and therefore the legislature would have no choice to, but to step in. And we thought the best safeguard against that was to just insist that these ballots be segregated in every state. So that was the way in which all this kind of fit together, those, those kinds of judgments. That's interesting. Well, let's go to Walter. Walter, you were you were pretty confident that you weren't going to have to do too much. I think you may be on mute there, uh, but it turned out <laughs> you had a pretty significant role after uh, after the election and uh, after the electors. Uh, why don't you talk about what you were prepared for? And, and were, you, were you prepared for one six? Because that was a startling event in our history. Well, yeah, in, in one sense we were. We were not prepared for a mob onslaught, although I think it was Don that was raising the question early on about um, once the president had called his tens of millions of followers to come to Washington, how we would physically be able to get uh, representatives and senators to the Capitol building. That was Seth, actually. That was, was Seth. Seth, yeah. yeah Seth. Was Seth. Don and I, Don and I, Don and I, constantly outdid each other for who was the most paranoid yeah. of the three of us. Get the paranoid of the day award, right? <laughs> yeah. so, uh, <laughs> but to um, uh, just to go back briefly, David, to a question, the second part of the question you asked about how well did the courts perform their role? I think we shouldn't leave that, particularly given the the Judicial Institute's uh, sponsorship of this with ALI that they really did an extraordinary job. And I have never s had an experience in a very long time in law where I was more impressed with just the, the way the civil justice system operates. We think about the ideological determinations of our highest court uh, on major issues, but in terms of actually sort of sorting out the wheat and chaff, the, the facts from the 
um, uh, from, from just fake made up issues. They do a very good job, regardless of whether they were Republican or Democratic appointees, regardless of whether they've been appointed by President Obama or by President Trump. And the way the process works very simply, I was so struck the the argument was made recurringly in press conferences that Republican observers had been shut out of the counting rooms, that the counting of, of ballots was, was taking place in secret and with paper put up so nobody could see inside. So obviously they're hiding something. And that was sort of a, a background against, uh, against the issues. Well, when, when we get to court, it, it, it happens that a judge wants to know, well, you, know, you need some, what is your proffer of proof that Republican observers were excluded? And they put up a Republican who was an observer who was, has an affidavit that he was excluded from entering the Detroit County facility, which is one item of proof. The counter affidavits come in and they show that there were 200 Republican observers and more than 200 Democratic observers in the county. And nobody else gets in until people leave because it was overcrowded. But he had no idea what the what the party was of the people who had to wait outside. And there was no answer to that. And that's the sort of thing that happens in the civil justice system. But one of the judges in one of the cases said to counsel for uh, the, 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 uh, the, the challengers, uh, were there any Republican observers in the counting room? This is in another state. And the answer was, a word salad about the importance of transparency. And the judge leans forward and as one sort of feels through the transcript and says, counsel, I'm asking you as an officer of the court, were there Republican observers in the counting room? And there's a very, one imagines weak, yes. How many? Not so sure. Given an estimate, a number greater than zero. I mean, that's what happens when, that's not sort of large ideology, it's just, what are the affidavits and the counter affidavits? And that the, the issue of, of, of secret ballot counting just melts away once it is subjected to the kind of process we have in court where lawyers are officers of the, you know, officers of the court. Now, um, that was, um, so I, I took on the, we sort of divided it up roughly chronologically to begin with. Don was going to do the black helicopters prior to election day. <laughs> Seth was taking it from there. I had, uh, back at the time of Bush versus Gore, been prepared to argue, had Gore won the litigation, that the Florida legislature could not, after the fact, change the method of, of the manner of choosing electors. The Constitution gives sweeping authority to state legislature to determine the matter. Can they say on November 15th, Never mind what happened on number third. We've, we're changing the manner of choosing electors. So that was one, one issue. And, and, and we had, uh, we sort of subcontracted an excellent memorandum from Marty Lederman at Georgetown Law School, uh, an exhaustive memorandum on the legality of post-election day resolutions by state legislatures awarding the changing the manner of choosing electors. And that was the predicate uh, for SES teams to make that operational in terms of being ready at every critical state to challenge the authority of the state legislatures to do that. And that was really, I thought, the, the, the two greatest risks that we faced. Uh, one was that the state legislatures would presume to use that authority. And uh, uh, I think it turns out there was more political resistance to that than we might have thought. Uh, even if they, they had this argument of, of, the, of, of authority, that having voters, Republican, Democrat, and Independent, who had stood in line for hours and hours on election day, only to be told by their state legislature, never mind. Don was worried, the way these things all work together, about the synergy that would come if they had some reason to cast doubt on that vote. And therefore said, we can't, the legislature, said, we simply can't trust what happened on election day. For, for any one of these various reasons. And therefore, the legislature has to itself make a judgment and award the electors. That, that, that was a very serious risk. And we were certainly prepared to, to litigate that. Um, there were a, a few that emerged that, that we hadn't anticipated 
uh, until shortly before the event. Um, one of them was in Wayne County in, in Michigan. Um, the canvassers have to certify the election at the county level and it goes to the state level and the state board uh, uh, then certifies the results. Michigan provides that there are four members, two from each party on every canvassing board. And the president of the United States was himself contacting two Republican canvassing board members, trying to get them to resist certifying the count from Wayne County, which is Detroit, so that they would be deadlocked two to two, which for 24 amazing hours happened. They simply wouldn't. And, and, and so that's when we were scrambling to, we saw it coming a few days ahead of time, I think, and we're scrambling to be ready to go into court on, 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 on that issue, what do you mandamus the canvassers? It, it, that was gonna be uh, you know, a, a, a tough undertaking. The one memo that we had put off till later was limitations on the authority of the vice president, that would be Vice President Pence, limitations on the authority of the vice president uh, in his role as presiding officer over the uh, January the 6th count. Um, we got increasingly nervous about that as time went on and we saw that contrary to how the press was viewing the unfolding post-election matter, that, that President Trump was dead set on relentlessly doing whatever he could to stay in power. And I think it didn't necessarily hurt us in litigation, but the, but the, but the accepted larger structure was that the president was being a bad sport, a petulant, a sore loser, uh, and that his folks were saying, he'll come around, he just needs to, you know, work through the loss. So we had initially prepared a memorandum for January the 6th on the role of the vice president uh, and put it off on the grounds that that was too remote a possibility. But as we got closer to January and it became clear that they were going to, the president was going to use every lever of power he could to stay in authority, including, I think history will show what enormous and unrelenting pressure he must have placed on Vice President uh, Pence, who we know spent considerable time the night before uh, January the 6th. We also knew to be concerned that the Congress go ahead and assemble on January 3rd and not postpone that to be closer to January the 6th to make sure that senators and representatives could actually be in Washington and not be caught in or in some sudden snowstorm. Um, so, right, Walter. Uh, well, I think Walter volunteered. I know it was me and probably Don as well. That if necessary, if the weather were inclement in the first weekend after, I think the third when they were supposed to come was a Sunday. That the three of us would, you know, would hire black Cadillac Escalantes and drive out to, you know. Wyoming and Idaho and Colorado and just drive congressmen to Washington, D.C. to be there. By the end, by the end, the biggest notebook I had was the January 6th issues getting getting ready for it, because that's when we knew we were, uh, you know, we were in a, a very, very serious, uh, very serious battle. And one of the problems would be if any of these state legislatures had yielded to the uh, pressure, you know, the president calling state legislatures to the White House, state legislative leaders from Michigan. If if any state had broken, um, we were worried about where this would lead, and uh, but we were fully prepared to to litigate that. But uh, from the perspective, from our perspective, we're greatly relieved. We're impressed at how well the courts operated, but uh, it was a nearer thing than one would have wished it had been. Right, guys? Yep. It was- uh, uh, Yeah, <laughs> to quote Wellington after Waterloo, it was a near, a near run thing. Uh, <laughs> so one of, the things I, one of the things I guess I would just add to what Walter said is just how many, as it happened, the date for the meeting of the electors went off fine. Um, but there were lots and lots of scenarios that we worried about, about, you know, the, the rather sparse language in the Constitution, and for that matter, even in the Electoral Counting Act, which I think the, each of the three of us came to learn by heart, even 
in the more highly reticulated sections like section 15, which governs the joint meeting about, you know, well, what happens if, you know, where do the electors meet? And what happens if they're prevented from meeting? And do they have to meet in the state capitol? And what if the state capitol won't allow the Biden electors to meet there? What happens if even the Biden, in a state where Biden won the popular vote, the Biden electors meet, but the, the Trump electors present themselves and have their own meeting. And there are competing slates of electors that will appear on the 6th. And we had lots and lots of pleadings and lots and lots of states addressing those scenarios. And you know, to Walter's point about the, the role of the vice president and the interaction between articles, the provisions of articles uh, one and two about, and the, the, the relevant constitutional amendments dealing with the joint session and the, the inauguration, I mean, we had, we were not prepared with a litigation response to an armed insurrection of the Capitol, both because neither Don nor I was so paranoid that we actually thought that there would be an armed insurrection. But also if there were going to be an armed insurrection, one thing is relatively clear, which is a litigation response would not be in the pantheon of options for people who were worried about preventing it. But we did have, uh, you know, in particular, I, we had a team of volunteers who'd work with me and with Walter. And, you know, we had a complete set of papers ready to go in court in the event that something that some procedure that the Electoral Counting Act requires was not followed, including an assertion by the vice president that he had a non-ministerial role in announcing the, the vote and lots and lots of research and thinking about exactly what happens in the joint session, like what happens to those electoral votes and who counts them and, you know, uh, so we were ready with litigation, but not with litigation against what actually happened. Well, suppose uh, the vice president had said on January 5th uh, that he intended to uh, exercise discretionary authority over which uh, electoral uh, member the votes to, to count. Um, and would you have gone in for uh, some sort of de declaratory relief action? And where would you have gone? Would you would that go right to the Supreme Court, or would it go in? Uh, we where, we how, were. How, the answer is yes, and we we had pleadings ready to go to you know every avail every possible level. I mean, a lot of this would have de would have depended on the exigencies of the circumstances, but you know, somewhere, unless everybody's deleted them, somewhere we have a pretty complete set of, you know, a complaint, a uh, request for a TRO and full supporting briefs on, on this question. So let, let's uh, circle back uh, to each one of you um, in, in the following way. Uh, so you did a lot, you're, you're such great lawyers and Great lawyers are really good at what if, you know, and they, when they're planning a big litigation, you know, what if the courthouse falls down and they plan for everything and you use those skills here. So, but you learned a lot from it. Um, and Don made this point. Uh, what you learned is how uncertain in, and uncharted many areas of the electoral structure are. And it's dependent on uh, people following uh, past practice and uh, acting with with restraint and that sort of thing. Uh, but what issues persist, uh, would you say one or two from your portfolio that you think, you know, we're likely to confront again in one way or another, and we need to, to bring to some kind of resolution? Uh, I'll give you, I'll tell you one thing that I've heard from some judges, which is that in the run up to an election, they are very uncertain about their authority to handle or to deal with uh, different procedures. You know, let's say in the three months before an election, um, should they act, not act? Uh, you know, what degree of uh, authority can they can they exert when the Constitution seems to give this to state legislators? And they're they're very uncertain about that. Are there are there other 
issues like that that you see as major and as likely uh, to persist. So maybe we start with you, Don, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so that one is definitely one, um, and it you know it's got the dimension of what what can federal judges do under federal law, and then the dimension of what can state judges do uh, consistent with the federal constitution. So a lot of uncertainty surrounding that. Um, I'm, I'm a little less worried about that being an existential threat in the future because so much of that this year came out of the pandemic. Uh, and you, you know we shouldn't assume that conditions are always gonna be like that. The thing that worries me the most is um, not so much anything that, I, uh, that ended up in my bailiwick, but the one that Seth and Walter focused on about the role of the state legislature after the fact. You know, I, I think it, like if state legislatures were to say after election day, I'm changing the rules, we're changing the rules retroactively and uh, claiming the power to award the electors. I, I think I'm very confident that that would not survive judicial challenge. The problem will be is, you know, if it's a situation where it's really close, an election in a given state is really close and that state's determinative. If it were, you know, Florida all over again, Florida 2000 all over again, What's to prevent the state legislature from saying, we can't rely on these election results because there's too much uh, circumstantial evidence of fraud in the electoral process and we are stepping in. Um, I, I, it's just, there's no clear answer to that. There's no clear answer to how that should get resolved. And, and I see that as a big and uh, real worry. You know, one thing I will say too, that I feel better about, with respect to January 6th, because of what Vice President Pence did, there is now historical precedent that the answer is that the Vice President's role is only ministerial. And that probably will carry a fair amount of weight in the future. And I said, so I think that's important. Seth? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think that there are, there is a large unanswered question about the, the scope and force of what you know, what we everybody has been calling the Purcell principle, which is you know, derives from a Supreme Court opinion of that name, that posits that the general principle that in the immediate, the short term run up to an election, federal courts shouldn't be interfering or even expressing any opinions about what the voting procedures should or shouldn't be, notwithstanding plausible claims of a federal statutory or constitutional violation. Nobody knows, to your point, David, nobody knows how forceful that principle is, how unexceptionable that principle is, and, and what is in the run-up period mean? What does it mean? I mean, I think Don is right that so much of what happened this last election cycle was driven by the exigencies of a pandemic um, and state legislative and state court, state Supreme Court and state secretaries of state responses to that. It's not likely to be persistent, but I do think that the uncertainty about where this principle comes from and what it stands for and what its force and breadth is are questions that are going to be with us and, and somehow need to get resolved probably unfortunately through more litigation in the Supreme Court. I also think that there are lots of unanswered questions about the, the meaning of the provision of the constitution that says that the time, place and manner for choosing federal representatives uh, uh, you know, shall be made in each state, quote, by the legislature thereof. We know from the Arizona redistricting case that the legislature thereof can mean something more than the brick and mortar legislature. We don't know, as in, in the case that, you know, that where Don was actually counsel of record for the Pennsylvania Democratic Party, the, the, the issue that came up to the U.S. Supreme Court where the Pennsylvania Supreme Court had interpreted a provision of the Pennsylvania statute regarding uh, 
the number of days after which after election in which a properly timely postmarked ballot could be received was consistent with the federal constitutional delegation of the rulemaking authority in that regard to legislatures. And so I think, you know, I think those issues continue to persist. There are, you know, there have been arguments back and forth about um, the constitutionality of the Electoral Counting Act. Um, and, you know, none of those questions were, were broached or implicated as it happens, um, but, you know, they're still around. That's really, I think, uh, an area of serious concern. The, the January the 6th meeting of Congress is governed by the Electoral Count Act of 1887, and there's a a large question about the extent to which Congress sitting in 1887 can tell the Congress sitting in 2025 or any other year what, how they ought to go about determining um, uh, the validity of, 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 of the electors. I think we are heading towards a situation where two sets of electors are submitted. And we've ruled out the vice president as being the decision maker by this new president is now unnoted. But the question is, uh, is the governor's certification dispositive? The Electoral Count Act says so, but there's nothing in the Constitution that mentions any role for the state government at all. The electors themselves submit their, their and you could have two sets of electors claiming they are the electors properly chosen, submitting electoral votes to Congress, and a debate about whether it is constitutional for the Electoral Count Act to um, require deference of that sitting Congress to the governor, for example. And the Electoral Count Act itself, apart from questions of its constitutionality, there is a sentence in the Electoral Count Act that goes on for a couple of pages. I remember Seth saying he searched in vain for a period. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that it is, uh, uh, we did have elaborate memos on what that process will be like, should be like. and. The critical phrase in the Constitution is one of those uses of the passive voice, and the vote shall then be counted without saying exactly by whom, which is a very important question. So let's, uh, let's say, I, I'd like to ask two sort of big picture questions and they get, the, get a little bit bigger as I go, the second is bigger. Uh, but let's just start with the election process. You know, we, you've identified some pretty fundamental questions. And um, when I talk to people who have uh, a great deal of knowledge about elections, um, w w one thing they, they will say is how varied it is. We have this complicated system and every state and sometimes every county is different. Um, we're now heading into the use of uh, mailed ballots like we've never used, done before. And we have a post office that no longer postmarks most for first class mail. And so the states say, you know, it must be postmarked by such and such a date, but it turns out the post office doesn't postmark. So we got all these, I will call little, fairly little, fixable, probably fixable problems. And then we've got uh, constitutional interpretation, but we don't want to have a shipwreck. I mean, fortunately, uh, you know, thanks to your efforts and the efforts of others and maybe just good fortune, um, you know, we had an election and we now have a president, but you can see that, gee, with a very closely divided country uh, and with a willingness to test the boundaries, which is the, maybe the, the hallmark of our current era, uh, you know, how do we keep this from becoming a disaster? Is it, if you were the president or <laughs> you were the, in control in some way or another, would you appoint a bipartisan commission? What, how, how are we going to get on top of this? Well, um, look, one, one, one way to get on top of this is for the Congress of the United States finally to implement the authority that the Constitution gives it to itself prescribe the rules regarding the time, place, and manner for choosing federal elected officials. I mean, that same provision of the Constitution that says, you know, that it shall be determined in each state by the legislature thereof has another clause that basically says, you know, 
that is the case only in the absence of federal legislation. And of course, HR1 and S1, which are now pending and will be up for consideration in both the House and the Senate soon, do precisely that. Um, and eliminate this completely bewildering and ever-changing landscape in terms of who votes when, where, and under what conditions and with what safeguards and what preventative uh, 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 constraints in each, not only each state, but each county, and in many instances in each precinct. I mean, one of the issues that the Supreme Court is going to be considering in the arguments tomorrow in Arizona is the, the legal validity of a state rule that basically says in Arizona, if you vote in the wrong precinct, none of your votes will count, even for statewide and national office. In a back, that, that is a provision that the Secretary of State of Arizona herself, who is the chief elections officer, has said is invalid and in fact was not implemented because it arises in the backdrop of, of you know, different counties and jurisdictions in Arizona changing precinct lines very, very frequently to the point that people genuinely may be uncertain about which school they're supposed to go vote at. If there was a federal law that basically said, look, these are elections for federal officials we're going to have a uniform set of rules. Maybe we'll have a federal commission that will make the rules or whatever. Life would be a whole lot fairer and more predictable. Don, you want to add to that? Such yeah, a good answer. You know, another piece of it, too, I agree with everything that uh, Seth just said. Um, another piece of it, too, would be substantially uh, substantial increase in federal funding for the apparatus of uh, elections you know this the, we had situations in this uh, cycle where you know private donors and and, and uh, had hundreds of millions of dollars in grants to state and county local election officials to help them just pay for the cost of administering the election and that that kind of underinvestment you know it's important for the issues we're talking about it's also important for the uh, issue of the the you know security from uh, from a cyber assault uh, on the electoral process, which is something that's out there for the future too. So you know, very substantial. We we need to take the electoral process a lot more seriously in in that basic way as well. You know, we have to harden the infrastructure and get it in place and make sure it's secure and and make sure it's up to date. And we're, and we're a million miles from that now in this country. David, can I make two points? Yeah. Uh, which I think are important, really important. One is, you know, you've, and we appreciate your, uh, both ALI and the Black Institute giving the three of us a platform to get the band back together um, and reminisce. But I think it's terribly, terribly important for the public to recognize the degree of sacrifice and real devotion that, I mean, literally hundreds of volunteer lawyers made over the course of those nine months. I mean, I, I can speak to the lawyers on the, the dozens and dozens of teams that I was trying to coordinate. I mean, we're talking about people whose names are never, they're not gonna get a platform like we did, but they spent hundreds of hours as pure volunteers, no credit with their law firms, nothing to count toward you know, anything else other than trying to do the right thing for representative democracy. And I just wish there were a way, a better way that we could honor the people who made those sacrifices. In an era of COVID where many of them are young lawyers working at home with spouses at home and their children at home and a full plate of law firm clients to represent and still spending dozens of hours every week doing this. It, it is, that was another aspect of the dream come true part of this. It was inspiring, it really was. Yes, it really yeah, was. absolutely. The other thing I'd like to say is that, you know, it, you, you've asked questions about, you know, what are the unanswered questions and how well did the court system work and what are the things that continue to worry you? I mean, what worries me most is what produced this which is a level of 
social disintermediation in our political sociology in this country that is, I think, a mortal and very, very much enduring threat. And well, that, it, that it, was it's, my it's second... Just, that was my second big question, which is, you know, we have a big part of our population, which is very susceptible now to conspiracy theories and to accepting uh, assertions that are not fact-based and a huge distrust of the media and this gigantic role for social media. You're concerned about it. And I'm I just concerned to... that there, you know, we, we've developed into a society in which there are, you know, we are not, this is not, you know, one republic indivisible. Um, people get their news or what passes for news from utterly different sources. The, you know, the, the atomization of our society has allowed people the freedom to essentially hear whatever they want to hear and only speak to people that say what they want to hear. And the net result is that I just feel like we, our country is at a, 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 a frightening crossroads of not becoming, you know, one Republic indivisible where, you know, people can have policy debates and talk about you know, issues with the idea that we're going to compromise and we have to be tolerant and we have to very much recognize the voices of other people, but we have a shared conception of what the country stands for. And it's that shared conception that triumphs over, you know, very, very heated divisions on particular issues and how to reclaim that sense of we are Americans is is a is a very very perplexing and frightening challenge and it's one that lawyers that legal skills are not really even relevant to address and i'm spending my time you know post january 6th trying to figure out how as a citizen i can do something in my own little way to build back civil discourse and a sense of the American community. So I, I, I agree with you, but I, I think you're being too modest. I think actually lawyers and, and judges and others do have this skill of being able to uh, disagree, make the arguments, shake hands, get a drink. Uh, often you're looking for a way to get to a consensus in a case, to, to a settlement, to some common ground, and, and lawyers are very good at that. So uh, we don't need to be our most divisive, um, but you've, you've really teed it up nicely. And I, I know you, you have to go, but uh, maybe Walter and then Don, maybe could you address this big picture for us? Uh, you know, we have, a, we have a very divided country apparently, and, um, and it doesn't feel very good. And it's hard to find sort of common, a, a sense of common purpose. So how can we help? <laughs> Walter. Well, you know, I, I, um, I think by practicing civil discourse is, is one way that, that lawyers can help. The problem is, as many sources, but one of them is that um, uh, our parties are now becoming more ideologically pure. Our parties were where we often worked out these, uh, these issues and, and wound up in most years with a fairly um, centrist candidates from, from each party uh, being the contenders, but the, uh, a number of issues starting in 1965 led to the ideological purification of the parties, which I think is, uh, is very, very, very sad. Coupled with the fact that geographically there's been an extraordinary increase in the, in the uh, fact that people are living only near people who agree with them. Yeah. Uh, that the, the, the every every recurring census shows that is is developing, and we need to find ways. I uh, the communications people needs to find ways of of of, of reaching 
people that disagree with other people, and then maybe lawyers could play a role if we could if we could actually get people to listen somehow. Don, and I just add one more thing that I think we can do, and which will address something that worries me a great deal, which I th I think we can valorize acts of courage in this sphere. Uh, you know, the young man on the Michigan Canvassing Commission, the Republican who decided to vote to break the tie. Now he's, you know, he, he's seen his career go up in flames as a result of that. But what he did was principled and right and courageous. Uh, Secretary of State Raffensperger in Georgia, you know, he may have done uh, irretrievable damage to his political future, but what he did was right. And honoring people who act that way you know, uh, all of us as a, as a profession in particular, honoring people who act that way, uh, I think is, is gonna be really important because if people who act that way find that their uh, careers go up in flames uh, and that's that, and then nobody ever thinks about them again, then who's gonna be willing to step in the next time and be equally courageous? You know, I, I think that's, it's important, I think, to highlight those which I think made a big difference over the course of the fall. And, and we want to honor people like that. Well, that's such a great place to end. Thank you, uh, the three of you, the, the three SGs, SG3. Uh, you played a very important role, obviously, and uh, it's been really interesting uh, talking to you. You're just uh, delightful and you're, you're so talented. And uh, I admire and we all admire each one of you and, the, and, and as Seth said, the team of young lawyers behind you. So that gives us hope. Uh, you know, we are in a so-called moment and we know we have a lot of work to do, but uh, with, such, with such a talented bench and uh, with all this, this um, energy and incredible talent behind you, I think, uh, you know, we can, we can be hopeful. This has been a production of the Bolch Judicial Institute and the American Law Institute. I'm David Levy. Thank you so much for joining us. And thanks to the three of you.